Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show in which we explore the story of you through the lens of the Enneagram. My name is Anthony Skinner, producer of the show, and man, we've got a good one for you today. Uh, Dr. Dan Allender, he is professor of counseling psychology at the Seattle School and founder of the Allender Center. He is host of the popular podcast, the Allender Center Podcast. He's written multiple books. Uh, he specializes in trauma, sexual abuse recovery, love and forgiveness and intimacy. Um, he is a treat. He's brilliant and he brings it today. You are going to love this show. I can't wait for you to hear it before I pass it off to our host. I want to let you know that Ian has his brand new book. Um, is The pre-sale is up and if you buy the book now, and then you go to ianmorgancron.com slash the story of you. You can actually cash in on getting the first chapter now. And you can get a three month free uh, subscription to the Typology Institute membership. Uh, so that's a, a big bonus. Lots of really good perks there. Uh, if you go ahead and buy the book now for pre-sale. So make sure you tell your friends and family about it. Uh, I've already read it. It's fantastic. I know you're going to love it. I'm glad you're here. That's it for me, Anthony Skinner. And now here is the host of our show, Ian Crum. Dan Allender, Enneagram 8, author of the new book, Redeeming Heartache, How Past Suffering Reveals Our True Calling. Welcome to Typology. Ian, a uh, delight to be with you and honored to be with you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. We were sort of recounting our, our, our personal history. Let's just do it again, because it's, it's kind of fun mm -hmm. for people to know that you're not just a, a, a person that I met through a, my, you know, a publicist, that you are an actual person that I have history with. Yeah, and, and, but I needed confirmation, because you know when you get aged, there, there's a certain loopiness or... Yes a lot of gaps, but I remember sitting at your table in your home uh, approximately 25 some years ago. And that was my first encounter with the Enneagram. Wow. Mm. That's well, so great. That's, that's a wonderful place to start, Dan. It's a wonderful place to start because I know you now have a lot of thoughts uh, about the Enneagram. In fact, we're going to get to those because in the book itself, there is actually the Allender theory of the Enneagram. <laughs> yes, Dan, I read it. I'm one of the I'm one of the few interviewers who reads the books of the people who come to be on the show. Scary, so, that's I so know. scary. <laughs> I ain't operating off the publicist questions, man. Okay, I know. We're going in. I, you know the publicist questions are very good, sincere, but they are so tiresome. Yes, glorious. <laughs> yes. So, a, an actual reader. Uh, it's a little bit like meeting a leprechaun. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well said, my friend. Okay, I want to dive right in. I, you now have mentioned that you were first introduced to the Enneagram back uh, over dinner with me 25 or so years ago. How has your understanding of the Enneagram, oh, how did you feel about it when you first heard about it? And how has your understanding of it evolved over time? Well, I, let me just start with this, Ian. I've always had great respect for you. I really enjoyed that meal, but I did think you were nuts. And I likely... <laughs> Get in line. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I felt like that was a long cue. So it wasn't like a, a novel thought that you might just be from another world. So the conversation about an Enneagram, like this ancient, who knows where in the world it came from, nosology that describes the human condition almost too perfectly, you know, it was like, uh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And you're interesting. You're more interesting than the Enneagram. But there was like all those early experiences where you go, I couldn't dismiss it. Hmm. And yet I did uh, mm -hmm. and likely still do. But still, uh, you know, the power of description, the power mm. of word and the power of organization, pattern structures. I mean, we are all 
it, we need it. We mm. need categories to somehow put together the inchoate and chaotic structures mm -hmm. of, of life. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm a fan, but I'm not bright enough to understand much. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, you have done so much work of your own as a psychologist, as an author, as an academician, you know, that uh, finding time to squeeze in the Enneagram probably isn't on the list of things to do. However, I, I, I do agree with you, I think, and we're going to talk about this because you might be surprised to, to know that I feel similarly about the Enneagram as you do. I'm the one who's always trying to talk people out of having this frothy mouthed kind of crazy obsession with it, which I think actually diminishes its value. It doesn't actually do anything to help it. I think the Enneagram is a imperfect, low resolution picture of the, of, um, the human person. I don't know if there are nine types, but these types tend to appear in the population so often, we should just pay attention. You know what yes. I mean? Yes. Uh, so I, I think I hold it more lightly. I think I actually disappoint people sometimes because I, I kind of hold it more lightly than they thought I would. Um, and uh, but that's how it goes. That's uh, that's how I am, you know. Well, in, anytime something becomes a structure of dogmatism, mm -hmm. you already know that individual is leaning into a clarity that life doesn't, doesn't offer. Mm -hmm. Scripture doesn't offer. God mm -hmm. doesn't offer. But on the other hand, back to that point, uh, without some structure, uh, the liquid chaos of life will drown us. So we've yeah. got to, we've got to be able to hold this lightly and yet hold it. Yes, absolutely. And mm, I think, that's good. you know, it's a starting place of conversation about the mystery of who we are and the mystery mm -hmm. of who God is. It, yeah. it, it doesn't remove, it doesn't deny the human, doesn't deny complexity. And that's the problem I think many people have when they first uh, become students of the Enneagram. They, they begin to uh, downgrade the, the crazy galactic nature of our interior world, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, actually, I was reading just last night, Anthony, about the human mind, the human brain, mm -hmm. that when you look at all the, the pathways and blah, you know, I'm not a neuro, neuropsychologist, but you know, it basically, it's bigger than the internet. <laughs> and I went, thank God. <laughs> glad something's bigger than the internet and I'm glad it's in my head. Um, and I can account for that, in, that kind of insanity in, at, at any rate. I love right. how you're making the argument that we need the structure though, because we yes. hear a lot of times yes. only nine types, yes. but in reality, it's not limiting, it's clarifying. And we, we yeah. need that clarity. Mm -hmm. As a jumping mm -hmm. off place, right? Not, not as a, a, the final word, but simply as a jumping off place into a much broader conversation, for sure. So, Dan, you self-identify as an eight. And, uh, and what's so interesting to me is I, I'm not surprised you're an eight. I've heard you speak many times. We've shared uh, stages at conferences mm -hmm. uh, where we both were speaking. I, years and years ago, I went to workshops of, of yours at, at uh, Colorado Christian University, uh, where you were at that time. Part of me also wondered if you were an Enneagram for the individualist. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious. And by the way, you're wearing some serious four, <laughs> you're wearing some serious four glasses right for now, sure. man. I'm just telling for you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, he's he's sporting <laughs> yeah. the four that right just, now. That that tickles me. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, and and here's here's why, and then I want to ask, uh, just probe it a little bit. Um, you are so comfortable with dark emotions mm -hmm. that people either are too afraid to acknowledge um, or refuse to acknowledge until perhaps life makes it impossible for them not to. Um, you're a good guide mm -hmm. through those emotions. You, you um, are able to help people navigate them beautifully. Uh, you're empathic, right? Your writing is empathic. Your, your self-presentation is as well. 
trying to make sense of suffering. And I went back and looked at your bibliography, right? And we've got titles like Cry of the Soul, Healing the Wounded Heart, Healing Path, Leading with a Limp. And I'm thinking, I don't know, an eight might write a book called Get Over Yourself. I mean, you know, it's like, you know. <laughs> no. Yeah, oh, I, again, I love this because there is an element to which, you know, I. I I think I am an eight, but I am such an ambivalent eight. Mm, like mm. I just don't fit eight. But mm. uh, you know, when you put the you put the suit on and you go, uh, yeah, it does fit, yeah, and yet so, it doesn't. And so, right. you know, sort of the mm. um, tragic romanticizer of mm -hmm. the four. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. true. But I'd also say, you know. Uh, it, in the context of my family, uh, I was an only child, and uh, my mother, borderline personality disorder, mm -hmm. my father, deeply avoidant, and left me mm. entirely in charge of her madness. Mm. So I was making decisions like an eight at six and seven and mm. all the way through my life as to how our world would work, mm -hmm. yet I hated it. I felt the power and enjoyed it, and I hated the responsibility and the fact that no matter what I ever did as an eight, it always failed ultimately, you know, in the abyss of her own pathology. So, you know, I, I think in some ways we can say, oh, I fit for, oh, so much more uh, than an eight, yet functioning in the world. Uh, you know, I've been part of starting a school, part of starting this thing called the Allender Center. You know, I'm 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 an entrepreneur, theorist, builder, boss, leader, who'd like. I'd rather sit on a park bench and watch people walk by. You know, in that yeah. sense, I'm more like a five. Yeah. So, uh, it, uh, you know, it, there's just moments where I kind of go. I don't know what the hell I am. So, you know, um, let's just talk about that for a sec. Let's talk about the, the just the difference between eights and fours. And I can't do a deep dive into this, right? And by way of just, you know, thematically a larger idea, you are all nine types. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's just that you're dominant in one. So of course you carry features, uh, characteristic features of fours and ones and twos, right? It's the unconscious motivation really that, that mm -hmm. distinguishes them. I think, for the eight, we would describe their unconscious motivation as a need to assert strength and power over the environment and others in order to mask and perhaps even uh, disown feelings of, of vulnerability and weakness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is that sort of defended, sometimes a, a very aggressive, commandeering, notoriously blunt, uh, you know, personality all in service to really masking um, tenderness uh, mm -hmm. and hiding innocence, which we can sort of explore a little bit. Now the fours, uh, what's happening there? So the four has this fundamental belief that they're missing something essential in their core makeup um, that everybody else seems to have mm -hmm. except them. And they um, are therefore feel compelled to as a compensatory strategy to project an image of uniqueness and specialness, right? In order to um, um, find a sense of belonging, which they they which is hard for someone who feels like they've been relegated to the aisle of misfit toys, right? Yep. Um, and it sounds like you're saying I, I really identify more with that first motivation versus the second. Is that true or not? Oh, no, they're both and. Okay. I mean, you know, as you say that, and then it, it's like kind of context, because in, mm. in the language of, of what we wrote in Redeeming Heartache, we're, we're, this, the four is a stranger. Mm -hmm. That sense of I don't mm -hmm. fit. Yes. And I truly didn't fit. Mm -hmm. and, and I knew from, oh, my God, from kindergarten, like, you're all standing in line. What in the world's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. Just, just go in, uh, and and so almost every way of being in the world felt quite out of sync. Mm. Yet, 
uh, as I said, the responsibility was to make this chaotic, crazy world work for my mother. So mm -hmm. I had to be strong. Mm -hmm. I had to make decisions on her behalf when she'd melt down in a, in a, in a grocery store uh, yes. at age six and seven. So that interplay of the stranger on one hand, uh, and yet on the other hand, the failed leader mm. uh, on the other. And that's why I keep going back to the Enneagram is so powerful to step into story. Yes. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not just a key like, oh, I'm an eight. It's a key to step into the complexity and at times the what what really is profoundly uh, contradictory yes. elements of all our stories. I'm getting chili bumps. Yeah. Okay, let me tell you why. So uh, I have a new book coming out in December called The Story of You. And it is a, uh, it's, this doesn't, it's not in the subtitle, but essentially what it was, I began to read a number of years ago, um, uh, narrative therapists, and mm -hmm. particularly Dan McAdams, among others. Yeah. And, um, and it confirmed something I had always felt, and I'm going to make an admission now that's going to get me into trouble, which is, I often looked at the Enneagram and thought, okay, personality types, I get it. But personality is such a hotly contested word in psychology, right? It's like, nobody knows about, you know, it's like everybody's got their own, you know, sacred opinion, but you know, so I kept thinking to myself, that's yes, and, but what is it really? And what I came, after I began studying narrative therapy, I went, oh, wait a minute. These are nine stories. Mm -hmm. These are nine stories that people gravitate toward and adopt in childhood as a way to make sense of trauma, of suffering, of all of the things that uh, are happening to them because they need a coherent story or they will be functionally mentally ill. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, you yes. just can't live without a narrative framework, mm -hmm. right? And so I was excited to talk to you in, in part, I'm jumping ahead in the interview here a little bit because I'm curious to know, what well, what are you, this is a brand new book. I'm terrified like you are with every book that comes out, especially if you're a four like me, right? <laughs> because you've already anticipated, you know, massive abandonment. Um, of course. <laughs> right. So what do you think? Do you, do you, do you, how do you resonate with that idea? That, I, that's, I mean, you, you, I can't wait for the book. That's Great. my response. Can't wait for the book because then it goes away from being a key that mm. it, it, you don't need a lock. Mm -hmm. And you go, wait, 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 wait. A key is opening up a door. Uh, so just having a key is at, essentially useless unless you're opening a door. But a door to what? Not to a type, but to a realm. Mm. Oh. And to me, Ooh. it's the realm of stories. Yes. You know, I mean, we have more stories then we've got any capacity. I mean, what you were talking about, the brain, minimum three billion cells. And the thing that's so wild is those cells can interact almost in a category of infinite. Mm -hmm. So when you start going, wait a minute, what's three billion squared you know, to the nth power? Well, it, it, it is more complex than any computer can ever be, the internet can be. Mm. And yet, you know, the idea that, wait a minute, I don't believe in a so-called inner child, but what I do believe in is neurologically, I hold images, I hold sensations, I hold slivers of memory of myself as a four-year-old, a 22-year-old. Mm. That's what we were doing initially was like, am I locating myself I can almost see the table we're sitting at, mm -hmm. but the more confirmation, actually the more data comes as to the nature of the story. And mm -hmm. our stories are not just big theory. Our story is the particular moments that shaped us in moments of fear, moments of rage and anger, moments of shame. So all that to say, yeah, move December up. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could, but you know, I love when they, I, I, you know, we're going to return, but we go off on these little tangents that I, that I hope are helpful to people because when conversations get going, juices get going and they're, that's so fun. Um, Dan McAdams says, you know, all transformation is story transformation, which 
you know, obviously maybe hyperbole for the, for the sake of illustration, but I think he's got a point, right? Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, with the Enneagram, I think, you know, it's like, well, how do I work with this, right? It's like, well, do I move some furniture around on the deck of my personality? I mean, what do we do, right? And it's like, no, if it's a story that you tell yourself and others about who you are, and it's a broken story, we know that because every story is in direct opposition to the story of grace. Mm -hmm. Yes, They all yes. are. Yes. If you're an eight, is that how God wants you to move through the world? No, it's a crappy story. Right. It, it helped you as a little person. But as Jung said, what helps you in the morning of life going to kill you in the afternoon. Right. So mm -hmm. you got to you got to ditch the story. And for me, that's where the transformation takes place. How do we deconstruct the story and begin to co-create, co-write a new story mm -hmm. with God that will be truer to who your to what your original goodness is, if I can say it yes. that way. Right. It's to, beautiful. To your original yep. goodness. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, you've got, ultimately, we have to decenter ourselves. Yes. But that that yeah. sounds to many people like they've already lived such a decentered life that they're going to be doing more harm. But to go, even the people who hate themselves mm -hmm. have made themselves very much the center of their own failure in the world. Mm -hmm. and that, you know, the moment you sort of get yourself off the core then you can begin to decontextualize. Mm. Uh, and that means I get to see something of the context of how I came to be. Mm. You know, the world is not borderline. But for me, uh, uh, yeah, no, it was entirely borderline. Mm -hmm. And to begin to go, well, there, there's a lot of borderline activity, particularly in politics, certainly in the context of, of ministry at the church, interplay of borderline and narcissistic uh, a lot. But to be able to go, I've got to decontextualize it by entering it, which mm -hmm. sounds contradictory. I've mm -hmm. got to step into the story, yeah. but I, I need doorways. And to me, yeah. uh, all nine are doorways mm -hmm. that you know, in one sense, I want to say it's more than a doorway. It's more like a doorway to a really remarkable, deeply broken, but stunningly beautiful abode yes. that we need to walk through. Yes. Mm. And I would say just just to, to circle back, because I want our folks to, by way of just good information for them, you know, eights and fours t can really be often very good friends because they both feel very misunderstood by the world. Right. Yes. Um, eights and fours uh, rem both remember childhood wounds pretty clearly, but they have very different ways of getting over them. Mm -hmm. So for the eight, uh, it, eights tend to take a get over it approach generally um, to maintain independence and personal authority and autonomy, whereas fours have a hard time letting go of wounds mm -hmm. uh, and they're not as eager to get over them because in some ways, their suffering defines them. They're kind mm -hmm. of addicted to suffering. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's romantic. Yes. I, 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 yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've got a very deep erotic relationship with that deeply hurt boy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I would say, though, that that fours also are more willing to be dependent and reliant on others to work through feelings and wounds, much more so than eights are generally. Uh, and uh, now, here's the interesting thing that I would say, just in short, uh, that eights are fours turned inside out. <laughs> uh, that's never been said. I've never read that. That's a very, all right, beyond, <laughs> beyond the enjoyment of being with you, that's like, okay, we've got a little more work to do here. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's how the Enneagram always should affect us, right? Instead of a static description of character traits or whatever, you know, it's it's actually uh, illuminating the broken places that need to be addressed. But that eight and four are just really turned, you know, eights are just up, in, turned out, four is turned inside out, right? The four yep. is more vulnerable on the outside, but very resilient on the inside. Eights are very resilient and uh, on the outside, but very tender and vulnerable and weak and vulnerable on the inside, mm -hmm. right? So it's, a, it's just an easy way for people to get their arms around, you know, fours and eights mm -hmm. and why I think we get along. And uh, so what are you going to say, Dan? And that's going to show up in the book, right? 
Actually, it doesn't. I just was thinking about it today. <laughs> next book. You know how it is. You write a book workbook. and then for the next six months, you go, damn it, damn it. I know, I know. Well, when you finish a book, most people don't understand that it's like 200 years between yes. the time you put the last, last little jot or tittle in to when, you know, this thing, I don't know, it, it has to go around the universe two or three times before the publisher lets it out. Yep. But yeah, that's, that's, thank you. That's You're welcome. That's going to be fun to play with. All right. So I want to know about the book, Redeeming Heartache, How Past Suffering Reveals Our True Calling. I'm going to throw out the typical publicist question first, which is give me a, but I'm going to use a better word. Can you give us a precis of the book? <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, it, the, the bottom line is this. I, I have been intrigued by darkness, and uh, which is another word for trauma. And it, I, you know, how you come to things and you go, it's right in front of me, right in front of me. But why did I not see it before? I was reading, I think it was Psalm 94, where it talks about the foreigner, the widow, uh, the orphan, and the vulnerability of them. And, and it was like, that's trauma. Mm. And, uh, you know, we need story. Another word for that is we need archetypes. Mm -hmm. And the nine are a form of archetype. Mm -hmm. And the notion of these are the three central figures of living in a fallen world. Yeah, there's other forms of being harmed, but we think of orphan as the person who has lost their parents. It is, but it's more than that. We all know there are orphan parts of us. Yes. Stranger. It's not just the foreigner. It's the fact that we all feel to some degree uh, out of belonging, out yes. of connection. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the widow is the hardest for me because I, I cannot imagine a moment on this earth without my wife, Becky. Mm. And I think one of the greatest fears of my life is to live a day on this earth without her. So the idea of loss, not just deprivation in the sense of an orphan, but the loss that death brings. Mm -hmm. So those categories began to echo in me at the level of, oh, wait a minute, this is a lens to talk about trauma mm -hmm. within the, the warp and the woof of, of the biblical literature. But I also had that sense that trauma is not just to be healed, it's actually meant to propel us into part of what we are on this earth to accomplish, mm -hmm. a, a kind of hell no hell no, I am not going to be part of X. And heaven, yes, I am meant to build something that bears mm. goodness and beauty and honor and delight. So as I began to play with that, um, I began to just think in terms of, well, what does it mean to be mature like Jesus? And that's the category of a priest, a prophet, and a king. So what I wanted to do was to connect how the orphan shapes the becoming priest, how the stranger becomes the framework for becoming a prophet. And the harder for people to initially get is how a widow or widower is actually the framework of becoming a king or a mm. queen. Mm. You know, so as I look at your life and reading your work, what I'd say is you are a brilliant stranger. Uh, and a phenomenal prophet. Mm -hmm. Not to say that you're not other. We're all meant, as you said, we're all nine. We're all meant to be a priest, a prophet, and a king or a queen. But the reality is we show up more at times with certain weakness, certain strengths. And I, I'm a prophet. I'm, I'm actually a pretty good priest. Uh, I suck as a king, which is strange to say as an eight. I hate being an eight. I hate being a king. But again, that's bound into story and in a lot of other events in my life. Right. But, but as we begin to play with archetypes, we've got categories for thinking about the nature of story. Hmm. It's wonderful. So just for my own sake, but also for the sake of people listening and for their clarity there's so much literature out there on trauma right now it's it's which the culture is a wash i mean if it, i hear people saying talking about their trauma every day 
Uh, and I'm wondering, and I'm not belittling it. I mean, I'm glad that it's in modern parlance. I mean, people are talking about it, which is fantastic. And it's beyond people that are, you know, are, have, you know, experience profound episodic trauma, complex trauma. But just from your perspective, because uh, I know you're going to say this very creatively and artfully, um, how would you define trauma briefly? Whenever you got a threat against your life, uh, and that threat can be the person who doesn't obey stop signs and goes right in front of you, and you missed, you were missed by two seconds. Well, that threat to your life is going to have at least a major rise in your stress biochemicals, adrenaline, noradrenaline, uh, cortisol. And in that process, you have just encountered a traumatic event, but you're probably not going to be traumatized. Mm -hmm. So events mm -hmm. themselves are not essentially traumatic. Oh, they are. But but it doesn't stay with you. Right. You know, you can metabolize that. You can swear at them. Um, uh, you can whatever. But it's where you are for any season left in a position where you're helpless, powerless. Mm -hmm. You can't affect. Even swearing at people feels like you've got some effect. But when you really can't change the world of threat, you got the two core elements. But let me add a third. It's self-blame. It's mm. that what, what's called with PTSD, moral injury. That sense of I'm somehow responsible for the harm I'm enduring. When you combine those three, the event that may not be that severe now becomes traumatic. It begins to be lodged in your body because of that combination of those three. Mm. Well said, because I mm. think no one, I don't want anyone to have to run, run out and buy Besser Bandicock's book and, and think that they have to make a great investment of time. I think uh, that sometimes having a pithy, if we can say that around trauma um, is, definition is, is helpful. And, you know, that's that, you know, I don't want to go too, too deep into it, but, you know, I was raised by a father that was a diagnosed. I remember speaking to his psychiatrist after my father was dead. And when the psychiatrist was dying at the same time, uh, that he had, he said that my father was clearly, uh, you know, narcissistic personality disorder, if not sort of low continuum sociopath. Mm -hmm. And uh, that my, you know, my mom also very narcissistic, uh, the most emotionally unattuned person I've really, that I think I've ever met. Now that may be through the lens mm -hmm. of a son injured son but there you go and so and my you know the way i cope with trauma was becoming a drug and alcohol i mean drug addict and alcoholic i mean we all got to find something right yep. um to to deal with trauma uh and unwinding the story of that the story that supported mm. that way of being in the world uh took a long time and so mm. that really leads my to my next question which is okay we've got trauma we we suffering trauma can propel us forward into a, a world where and i think we realize calling right the the errand upon which we've been sent here to fulfill right um the hell no learning to say hell no right very eightish by the way to say hell no to trauma <laughs> um and so how is it and i know this is a, a long answer but how do people find freedom and healing from painful memories and how does pain trauma set us up or prepare us for joy oh that's a good question yeah oh sweet question but let's start with this you know when you describe your mom uh you know the first word would be total lack of attunement mm -hmm. is a level of deprivation that's a little bit similar to what the CIA does when they torture, uh, and that is to leave you in a uh, soundless white room with no contours, therefore no, in one sense, no beauty whatsoever. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, I think so, yeah, I'll run with it. Um, and then if you're talking about a, a narcissist with such grandiosity 
that it actually moves into that realm of I have the power of God and a lack of conscience, then you're talking about uh, a, a, at least profound experiences of degradation. Yes. Many. So, so it, it, it th think of this, this as bookends, deprivation, torture, degradation, torture, um, which actually has more power. Well, deprivation. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Because at least when you've got somebody torturing you with cruelty, you've got something to push back against. Yes. So, you know, it, it, as you think in those terms, you go, well, as I read you, uh, it, it, you are a beautiful man, a beautiful writer. You have beautiful thoughts. Well, you can thank your mom for that because she left you <laughs> in one sense so empty for beauty that at some level you have craved it and sought it and created it. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand, your father tortured you, but with incredible cruelty. And, you know, just, you know, you cannot encounter you without having that sense of, oh, you are a kind man, a weird man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I would I would buy that. And I, there, and there's it, the eight it, coming through. But no, I mean, I always I mean, I love that kind of, you know, bold statements yeah. uh, but I, I think this explains too why you know it took me 20 years in therapy focusing on my mm. father before I woke up and said wait a minute <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> he's not the big problem it's her capital H <laughs> yes yes. Right. yes so you you have disrupted the church you, you have, in some ways, asked people to think deeply theologically from different vantage points. Mm. That's a stranger. Mm. That's a stranger working out what it means to be alien, wow. but okay. with incredible desire for connection. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's such a good-hearted orphan who is a priest inviting people into the connective links of story and and ritual and icons yes. so you go you know th these these bastards that criminally worked to kill us they created some level of defiance hell no but they also created something of this i long mm -hmm. i long and I want, not I, not I want possess, I want to be part of something stunning. So again, what I don't want to be heard is that we can thank our abusers. Right. Uh, I, I, I don't thank God for having been sexually abused. I don't mm -hmm. thank my abusers. What mm -hmm. I thank is that God will choose to use some of the darkest notes, some of the awfulest cacophony, and some kind of intersecting jazz and symphony that creates a beauty that if we will grieve loss and the depths of it, there will be this comfort. Blessed mm. are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That's either true or bullshit. And I think it's true, mostly. Yeah. Sometimes right. not. But overall, I think it's true. So there's that, shall we say, movement from trauma to a beautiful defiance that recreates a world that we didn't have on behalf of others who we want to bless, but we also want to join in the party that we're meant to, in one sense, create, but also become a participant in. Mm. Beautiful. Absolutely <laughs> totally. stunning. I'm yeah. getting a little serious. I'm getting a little you know dewey here it's yeah, been, it's it's I feel the I'm, same. I'm puddling as uh, the british would say and i think um these are you know these are words that to use the word long that that people do long to hear but mm -hmm. are very suspicious mm -hmm. and cynical mm -hmm. uh because let's just face it i'm a therapist you're a psychologist you you have far more research and of course you are practicing and teaching and so your depth of knowledge and application far greater than mine but i i would say that 
you know, most people don't show up at a therapist's door or a priest's door because they're having a great day. You know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. just part of the bargain, right? No one shows yeah. up at an AA meeting going, God, it's an awful, awesome day. I thought I'd end it here. <laughs> yeah, <know>? thank God. <laughs> I, I say thank God for that because right. people who have life together, uh, we're in a different realm. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, yes. And not only that, but they are supernaturally boring but that's a that's a that's another <laughs> issue right <laughs> well-adjusted people are just you know run away from at a cocktail party god they're awful just like gated community like walking into a gated community all the houses are the same anyway so the the thing i was going to say though was you know people arrive in therapy or they've been you know they've had bad therapy or they've had you know mm. etc right what you're talking about is a deep plunge into the most difficult emotion I think people face, which is grief. I honestly do. I, I don't think anger is yeah. bad. I don't think, I don't, you know, the grief, talk about powerlessness and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the lack of defenses and, and whatnot. I mean, Dan, people don't think they can survive what you're talking about, mm -hmm. right? And especially with trauma, profound trauma. I mean, how do you encourage people to make that move into yeah. the journey of healing, which moves through darkness, man, deep darkness. Yeah. Well, if, if, if I wish I had a dollar, just a dollar for every time I've heard somebody say, oh, my mother loved me. I'd be eh, not quite Bezos yet, but not far. Uh, on the other hand, I wish I had a dollar for every time somebody said, if I begin to let this affect mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. I will drown mm -hmm. in it. And that needs to be heard. We fear our bodies. You know, we don't actually believe that our body is a gifted self-healing phenomena. Can, I mean, can you explain that just a little bit? We fear our bodies. Open that up a little more. Well, it, you know, if we start with this, you know, your body wants wellness mm -hmm. and that's how God made you. But part of the process, for example, a lot of my back aches is because there's been a minor injury that the muscles around there mm -hmm. constrict to protect. Uh, thank God for that. Yet I go to the chiropractor to relieve the body's care of my back. Why? Mm -hmm. Because I don't have time to let my body heal. Wow. Uh, I've got work to do. I've got work today to do. Mm -hmm. So I go to the chiropractor. I'm not faulting it. I love my chiropractor. But so often we are so busy that we cannot take the time to let our bodies heal. Mm. And in that sense, we fear the pain of what's required for there to be healing. So mm -hmm. the fact that my back hurts is the way God meant for it to be mm -hmm. as the slower process of healing occurs. Mm -hmm. You know, if we make that quick metaphor into, you know, people are afraid that the grief they've avoided is actually going to kill them. Whereas mm -hmm. what's killing them, uh, and again, much like you, Ian, I, I, I spent eight or nine years in illicit pharmaceutical sales. Uh, because as an eight, I'm not going to just use drugs. I've got to at least make... <laughs> I want to make some dough on it. <laughs> I'm going to make some money off of it. You know, but... Oh, well, that's where killed... we met. <laughs> that's how I almost killed myself multiple times. Wow. So it's the basic premise of you think you're doing well by escaping. But in the long run, mm -hmm. I can show you in terms of the neurological, but also, uh, in some sense, the physiological effect of your effort to escape. It's called heart disease. It's called cancer. Uh, it's called a whole array. Every time you put the word itis on something, it's a construct that comes from your body's inflammation. Mm -hmm. What's causing the inflammation? Stress biochemicals. What's causing the stress biochemicals to remain at the level that they're at? The absence of tears. Mm. The absence of your heart being able to surrender to reality. We live in a death world, but we're also death-defying because of the resurrection. So we've got to be able to hold death 
and resurrection in a simultaneity that I think Picasso understood by how yeah. he painted the face, but Christians don't understand for some reason the concept of simultaneity. We live death every day, every hour, every minute. We live resurrection every day, every hour, every minute, but we're meant to hold them together, which is why if you accept a certain madness, you actually will recover a certain sanity. Mm. Wow. Brought to silence. Yeah. Love it when it happens. Yeah. Doesn't happen often. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, you know, uh, piece of editorial here. It's interesting, I think, that the reason why people often rarely get good therapy is because most therapists have become therapists to avoid the kind of work you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the difference between a great therapist mm -hmm. or spiritual director and uh, mm -hmm. someone who knows the language but doesn't know the work. Yeah. You know, and yeah. uh, so anyhow, that's that's neither here nor there, but that might help people process why they've been in therapy so many times and it hasn't hit. You've got to find a therapist that understands the language that we're really talking about mm -hmm. here. Yeah. I, I mean, you got to be as a good therapist and I believe I am. You got to be with people. You got to be mm -hmm. for people mm -hmm. and you got to be against people. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, uh, you know, you're not going to get out of my office alive. Uh, you aren't going to remain the same. We will fight, but we will also weep and we'll also join one another in the humanity of what it means to live in a fallen world. And mm. if you want, if you want niceness, I'm just not nice. If you want kindness, I'm growing. Uh, I'm a kind man. So that intersection of it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance, mm -hmm. not pleasantness, not holiness, not truth even. Kindness is mm -hmm. what opens the door to change. But we, I think we have mm -hmm. so often, maybe less in the last five years, but we trivialize kindness as the synonym being nice. Mm -hmm. And boy, oh boy, the presence of with, for, and against, it, I think is the element of, that's what I want in my wife. That's what I want in my friendships. Uh, yeah. If they're not with me, then mm. they're not for me. And if they're with me and for me, they better be against me. Uh, and in that, we can change. I can yeah. change. You can change. We can change. Mm. That's good. Okay. I, now I want to go to your school. Anyhow, um, <laughs> same, moving on. Same, so, same. um, I have a I have a personal trainer that uh, is trying to uh, as best he can uh, uh, stall death um, for, <laughs> for me. And, and, but but I, I have a way of just when people ask me about him, they go, "Well, what's Tim like?" And I say, "He's a fair man. He's a hard man, but he's fair." <laughs> So maybe you should have a sign in your office that says, I'm a, I'm a hard man, but I'm fair. I like the two fairs, though. He's yeah. fair. Yeah. He's hard. Yeah. Let me remind you. Yes. He's fair. Yep. Yeah. All that. All that, man, for sure. Okay, let's wrap up. I just want to talk about Allender's theory of the Enneagram because you actually have an addendum in the book. First of all, why did you, I mean, you've got this wonderful book about redeeming heartache. It's, it's covering all of these, this wonderful territory you've just described and far more because you also go into the six types of trauma. You go into all this other stuff that we can't possibly unpack entirely here. I, what I'm so excited about is people have heard your heart and your mind here, and it's going to inspire them mm -hmm. to buy redeeming heartache because that's what I want them to do. And so, but I do want to just hit on the fact, why did you put in an addendum about Allender's theory of the Enneagram, and what is it? Yeah, well, let me start with this. Uh, I think the most important, the first thing I read of anybody's book is, what would you guess? Um, Enneagram books, you mean, or? Any book, A every book, any book. And what's the first thing you read? Yeah. Out of all of them? The ending? The first title, or? Um, I, that's unfair, I'm, I'm being unkind here, but but. Uh, I'll tell you. The acknowledgments. Oh, because interesting. I, I need to know if you're grateful and mm. what kind of gratitude wow. actually exists, because it's going to be the lens by which I know how a little better how to read the book. Mm. Second, wow. 
I, I, the second thing I read randomly are footnotes. I want to see who you quote, who are your, you know, who's your conversational partners? And is it all academic? Or, you know, it just, I get mm -hmm. a lot out of the footnotes. And so from my standpoint, you know, uh, 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 I love the book that uh, Kathy Lorzell, my co-author, and I wrote. I think it's a good book, but I really love the footnotes. <laughs> uh, and addendums are where you go, damn it, I couldn't write on this because there are so many other things. But I have my thoughts. And, you know, when, when a publisher will let you put an addendum in, oh. It's like, oh, I got away with a little bit of murder. Yeah, you did. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the fact that it's there, it's in part because so many people in our community deeply appreciate uh, and, and utilize. But there are times where I feel like there's this division between Enneagram work, narrative work. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just want to say, I love the Enneagram. It's deeply useful, but don't forget the reading engagement of your story, which is why, uh, in some sense, I'm glad I you know, want to sell a trillion, quadrillion books. But really, this interview uh, is about your upcoming book. Hmm. Hmm. Because that's where wow. I go. Somebody who knows the Enneagram as deeply as you do but also sees how the narrative is the opening to the deeper, more complex part mm. of our lives. I think that will keep the Enneagram from being misused as sort of like this tell all of one's life versus the entry into the beauty and complexity of life, but where you've got to step into the narrative, not only thematic or you know abstract at 10,000 feet, but in the dirt. Because mm -hmm. I don't think change occurs outside of the dirt. Right. And that requires me to get into the very particular moments of what was deprivation like for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can talk theoretically at 10,000 feet, but there are moments in your life that are deeply seared oh, as yeah. well. If your father was as degrading as I believe he was, then there are moments of incredible humiliation. And where you get near humiliation you're you're up against the dark, dark work of the evil kingdom that mm -hmm. loves shame mm -hmm. and contempt. Mm -hmm. So that's that's why I wanted to bring that up was sort of like, ah, oh, hope the people who actually do the work richly in that writing actually take the narrative seriously. And already, mm -hmm. not due to what I did, but just due to your work, that's being done. Mm -hmm. So... Um the addendum uh you make several well you well you you beautifully express your appreciation for the enneagram and while at the same time uh issuing cautions right about how a unskillful um approach uh and application has to be avoided of all of those sort of cautions which is the one that really sticks out to you like this is the one thing i really hope people who love the enneagram won't do with it or think about it believe about it yeah what when when it becomes the label that explains everything mm -hmm. that that breaks my heart yes uh, because it's back to you want to live on the porch next to the door uh you don't want to go into the house go into the richness of what this doorway and the entryway opens the door to. Mm. So the curiosity as to what, what was within your world that compelled you to have to become the boss. On the other hand, what within your realm connects that to a four with regard to your dramatization and romanticizing of your own heartache? Okay, even after this conversation, do I have some work to do? Oh, yeah, but I, I don't feel like, oh, it's another burden. I thought I knew myself. It's more like, oh, God, there's so much more to me, but so much infinitely more to you and to how you want me to engage the reality of my identity 
in the larger domain of your very being. Mm -hmm. So I, I find it exciting, and uh, but I find any dogmatism limits not only God, but eventually shuts down the creativity of the human heart. Mm. Well, everybody, if this hasn't been one of the best podcasts I've ever done. <laughs> For real. <laughs> For real. And I've done hundreds. I've been on hundreds. And uh, this has been so, I'm not going to use the word, rich. <laughs> that I don't know where to start. I wish we could do a series of four or five together. How much fun would that be? Everybody. Well, let me just say, uh, 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 as the book comes out, it, November or December? December. Um, I, I'm going to have surgery on my shoulder in late November. So I'm going to be basically on opioids for about a month. Mm. But sometime in the next year, uh, I would love to get the opportunity of turning the so-called tables and Ooh. inviting you to our podcast. So I would let's do it. that. I, let's do that. Well, I mean, don't forget it. Uh, don't let Oxy drain the, drain the memory. <laughs> I don't, I, nah. I, no, don't let the Percocet, you know, undo. Yeah, I don't, no, I, 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 I always combine it with THC. So excellent. No Good man. There Good man. Go. Titrate everything just right. This is a man who's ready for a chemical misadventure, and I'm excited about it. <laughs> Next book, my chemical misadventure. <laughs> the year of living chemically. <laughs> All right. So everyone, listen, Redeeming Heartache, How Past Suffering Reveals Our True Calling by Dr. Dan Allender, A-L-L-E-N-D-E-R. Dan, what's your website? Uh... Oh, good Lord. Uh, uh, <laughs> good man. The, the Allender Center dot org, I think. OK, great. Well, people can look it up. They'll, they'll figure it out. And I'm sure they'll find all of your socials there, because I bet if I asked you, you would look at me like, nah, I don't have any idea. I don't even like someone else yeah, does that. Right. I'm not on Facebook. I don't know what they do. That's OK. It's 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 really all, all for the better. Dan, mm. thanks again. This has been. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Anthony. Oh, good gosh, to be with you, you both. Thank you so much. Typology family, may you have love, may you have joy, may you have peace, may you have healing, may you have rest. Until next time.